seashells evoke days at the beach and the beauty of nature. In other cultures and in other times, they've been used as both currency and as decoration. Look at the Italian grottos festooned with seashells that ultimately gave us the word grotesque. They're also useful in other ways. Neptune's son Triton used a conch shell as a trumpet, and as I'm sure anybody of my generation will remember in The Lord of the Flies, the conch shell comes to represent civilization and democracy. Ralph uses it to call meetings, and when it breaks, it heralds the boys' descent into disorder and chaos. But shells are also the remains of living creatures, and this gives them a strange sort of liminal quality, which can then impact the kind of folklore that we find around them. So we're going to dive into all things seashell and pearl in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Cedric, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are starting a brand new theme this month, and we're going to be looking at things related to the sea. And like I said in last week's episode, this is sort of a little bit of a crossover because it's kind of a way of looking at materials, which we did last month, by looking at seashells and pearls, but obviously they do have that link with the sea as well. So we are going to have a look at the folklore of shells and pearls in this week's episode. And we're going to start off with the scallop shell and St. James. So if you were to walk the Camino de Santiago pilgrimage route, you'll notice plenty of scallop shells on the markers. And in the past, priests gave pilgrims scallop shells when they arrived in Santiago de Compostela to prove that they'd completed the walk. Now, shells represent St. James, who's the patron saint of fishermen. And there are a few theories as to why this might be. Now, in one legend, merchants in the Middle Ages began selling shells as souvenirs to pilgrims, and that's where the link came from. Another legend has St. James curing a knight's throat disease by laying a scallop on his neck, and this was one of the 23 miracles St. James performed, and then people started hanging scallops above their beds or near where animals drank. In another legend, a storm sank the ship carrying St. James's remains, and his body washed up on the beach, apparently unmarked and covered in scallop shells. So there are all these different competing stories as to why St. James might be linked with scallop shells, but that's why they now appear on the pilgrimage route to where his remains are buried. Now, scallop shells are also associated with the goddess Venus, which is a completely different link, I think you'll agree. And Botticelli's famous painting, The Birth of Venus, sees her born from the sea, standing in an open shell. It's not strictly speaking her birth, since she came from the sea fully grown, but this does mark her arrival on land. And I think the fact it's a scallop shell in some ways is probably an artistic license, really, but I do think it is quite interesting seeing that link with a deity who comes from the sea and then being linked with the scallop shell. And then you've got St. James, who in one way or another, depending on which legend you look at, does end up associated with the sea, and the symbol of that link is the scallop shell. Now, I feel like if you're in the UK, I can't say the word seashells to you without you then thinking she sells seashells on the seashore. And one of the things I find really fascinating is the way that nursery rhymes and rhymes in general seem to end up with these weird origin stories, which, yes, you can read that much into them if you want to, but a lot of the time I feel like someone's reading too much into them, but then there's no evidence that that's the case. So, for example, the ring around the rosy myth that it's about the plague. Spoiler, it's not. And obviously you can find out more about that in the plague folklore episode. But the she sells seashells rhyme is likewise saddled with an origin myth. And in this one, people repeat the claim that the myth is really about Mary Anning. And for those of you who aren't in the know, Anning was an English 19th century paleontologist. Now, because of her working class background and status as a woman, many of her achievements have thus been claimed by male scientists instead. But she did actually help to discover categories of dinosaurs, including the pterosaur and plesiosaur. Incidentally, if you've seen the film Ammonite, then Kate Winslet played Mary Anning, so hopefully that'll help you know who she is. But many websites have made this claim that Anning's work inspired the tongue twister. But as Stephen Winnick points out, we should be very, very suspicious when no one provides any evidence to support their claim. 
So various sources, including QI and Mental Floss, have claimed that the Tongue Twister was originally a song, written in 1908 by Terry Sullivan and Harry Gifford. Fair enough. But there's no evidence that Sullivan wrote the lyrics about Anning's life. Many of the articles say things like, it's believed that, or many say that when making the link to Anning, and ultimately, that's essentially there to say there is no documented proof to show this is the case. And indeed, Winnick notes that no primary evidence supports the claim. Now, that's obviously not to say that no primary evidence exists. It's just that no one has found any yet. So that's one thing you've got to bear in mind. Just because someone hasn't found primary evidence doesn't mean there isn't any. But at the same time, you can't really make the claim without the primary evidence because then you wonder, well, where exactly did the idea come from in the first place? So like I say, the, the theory is that Terry Sullivan came up with the lyrics in 1908 based on Mary Anning. But... The tongue twister was not actually invented by Terry Sullivan in 1908. It was already a folk saying by 1908 and he simply turned it into a song. Winnick found the phrase sea sells seashells in an 1855 elocution manual so it really has predated that tongue twister by quite some time and it was only described as a tongue twister by 1871. The longer version including the by the seashore element dates to 1898. So ultimately, because all of these things predate the song in 1908, then we can pretty much say that the song isn't inspired by Mary Anning at all. And I do think that Mary Anning's contribution to science is worth a lot more than a tongue twister that isn't even about her. But if you do like ammonites and fossils and so on, then definitely check her out. Now, obviously, we can't do a fabulous folklore episode about something without looking at superstitions. And there's a few about shells. So drinking out of a shell meant that you'd soon fall in love. Opening shell clams meant that you'd have conflict in the family. But if you were opening oysters and found that some of them wouldn't open, it meant that money was coming your way, but you wouldn't inherit it. You should only eat oysters when there was an R in the month and to do otherwise meant you had financial problems. And opening shell oysters also meant that you'd hear about a death. Which is a bit of an odd one if you think about the fact that if you're opening them and someone open, you're going to get money, but you're not going to inherit it. But then opening them also means you hear about a death. You kind of go, hmm, those two almost seem like they could be related. But anyway, if shellfish have a lot of sand in their shells, it means a storm is coming. And if a large seashell roars, it means the sea is rough. And keeping seashells in front of the door will bring luck into the house, but it's bad luck to keep shells in the house. So, as far as that if a large seashell roars goes, I thought it was worth covering the folk myth that you can hear the ocean if you hold a shell to your ear. Now, it's a nice idea, but it's just not true. It's also not caused by the sound of blood in your ear, because if it was, the sound would change based on how much exertion you've done. And apparently people have actually tested this. The sound doesn't change based on how high your pulse is, so it's not simply roaring blood either. So the most likely explanation is that it's just simply ambient noise around you, which the seashell captures and then it resonates and that explains why different shells produce different sounds. But to be honest, you can actually create a similar ocean sound by simply cupping your hand around your ear. So you can have hours of fun trying that in your next three hour meeting that could have been an email. And also while we're looking at shells, we can't overlook the strange shelly coat And this is actually a spirit that appears in the folklore of Scotland and Northern England and it favours streams and rivers. Now the name comes from the fact that it wears a coat made of shells. Now Sir Walter Scott actually puts the shelly coat in the bogle category and considers it a water spirit. And in one of its pranks, the shelly coat throws its voice pretending to be a lost person in a river and two people then essentially follow the river and follow the shout saying that the person's lost to try and provide aid if they can. And the Shelley Code only reveals the jest, and I say jest in inverted commas because that's not very funny, when the two people essentially decide to give up chase because they're just too tired and exhausted from following this voice. And it seems that the Shelley Code enjoys hearty laughter when it successfully tricks someone. Now, Scott actually even considered that the Shelley Code might have some kind of relation or identification with the bar guest, which obviously I've covered in a previous episode. Now, other folklore does suggest that the Shelley Court can actually remove his shell-covered coat, and doing so would render the Shelley Court harmless, although no human would be able to pick the coat up. So while the tales do vary, the one thing that remains fairly consistent is the Shelley Court's rattling coat of shells. 
Now, I should point out as well that the Shelley Court, the way that it appears in the stories, it does very much seem to be more of one of those spirits that inhabits a space rather than necessarily guarding the space. So I wouldn't go quite so far as to say it's a guardian water spirit, but it does generally get found in and around water of some description, but often lakes and rivers. But obviously we can't also talk about shells without mentioning pearls. Now they actually form inside oysters when an irritant gets trapped in the shell. And some people think that that irritant is like a grain of sand, but according to one website, it's actually far more likely to be a morsel of food that gets trapped. And then the oyster realises it's there and coats the irritant with aragonite and conchelin. Now, these are the same materials that it also uses to make its shell as well. And it's the various combinations of these two materials that then give the pearl its luster and things like that. But despite these completely mundane beginnings, and I do find it quite amusing in some ways that humans place such a high value on pearls when essentially it's like an animal's way of dealing with a food irritant, which is quite interesting. But despite these mundane beginnings, pearls have become the material for the 30th wedding anniversary and they're also associated with wealth and luxury. And as a result, they're also part of various superstitions. Now, all of these superstitions come from the Encyclopedia of Superstitions, Folklore and the Occult Sciences of the World from 1903, so obviously they're all a little bit dated. But to dream of pearls meant hard times, worry or treason. You should put your pearls in a box with ash wood to stop them from turning yellow. Some people believe that pearls would turn white in clear weather, but then they would turn dull in cloudy weather. If you wear a pearl necklace, it should attract love. And in one superstition, pearls can also ward off fire and bring success in business, which is quite impressive. If you wear a ruby surrounded by pearls, this will bring wealth and honour to the wearer. And if you wear a scarf pin that includes a black pearl, that will cause friends to tell you their innermost thoughts. And black pearls in general actually bring good luck, which I thought was quite interesting. And a cross made of pearl can ward off evil spirits. You should make sure that you don't sing before you put on your pearls, otherwise you'll end up crying. And if you find a pearl button, then that's a sign that good luck was on the way. Now, speaking of pearl buttons, I did also want to put the pearly kings and queens of London in as well. This is a slight tangent, I think, but I wanted to put them in anyway. And the pearly kings and queens grew out of a custom made popular by costermongers. And essentially what would happen is the leading families in this particular trade would sew mother of pearl buttons onto black velveteen suits. And it really started to become quite popular in the late 19th century. And it still continues today. So each borough in London has a pearly king and queen, which is essentially the eldest couple in that borough's most respected family. And people still sew the buttons onto the suits in really decorative styles. And in some cases, they can be really, really impressive, like the patterns that they manage to achieve and so on. And sometimes people will then essentially hire pearly kings and queens to turn up at events and so on. So they are quite a popular mainstay of London folklore, which is a really cool tradition to keep going. So what do we actually make of the folklore of shells? Well, I think ultimately shells are quite an interesting material because they are ultimately the skeleton of the animal that lives inside and they are essentially created by those creatures, but they're what the creature leaves behind. So I can see why they would be considered bad luck for using within the home and things like that. And I think when you look at pearls, the fact that they're essentially a food irritant that the oyster has then turned into something we deem valuable, again, is quite interesting in a lot of ways. And it shows what we the weird things that humans put values on. But I think the fact that the relative lack of folklore about seashells in and of itself is quite interesting. Because when you look at a lot of the materials that were looked at last month, there was loads of folklore about them. But then when I was looking for seashells, there was a little bit less. Now, obviously, they are popular in other cultures and traditions. And Lilith Dorsey has an article about cowrie shells in divination. And obviously, I've very much been focusing more on Europe because obviously it's what I know. So I think it is in terms of our folklore in, in Europe. It's a little bit more down to that association with the saints, I think, and also deities like Venus as well. And I think that those links with the shells then essentially come through the link with the sea. So the shell then becomes a visual representative of the sea, even when that person or that figure is so far away from water. So that is how I think that kind of works. And I think the idea of having the shelly court being covered in shells in often freshwater areas, again, then speaks to the otherworldly nature of the shelly court. 
Pepper, please do let me know if you know any superstitions about shells or indeed pearls. Like I say, I will put the links below. So I will put that link to the Lilith Dorsey article about divination with cowrie shells if you're interested in that. And because we're doing the C this month, next week I am going to be a little bit self-indulgent because the famous Grace Darling, it's the anniversary of her heroism on the 7th of September. And I wanted to do the next episode about her. So we're going to have a look at the legend that is Grace Darling and some of the sort of folklore that's that's grown up around her. So we will be having a look at Grace Darling next week, which is going to be slightly different from what I normally do, but hopefully you'll enjoy it anyway. And then I've got a couple of other ideas for what to do for things to do with the sea, but please do let me know if there's anything else that you'd like to hear more about. I was considering doing one about legends related to lighthouses, but again, please do let me know if that's something that you'd like to hear more about. But without any further ado, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you next week when we go to meet Grace Darling. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.